On that December 21, 1943, for the crew of the B-24 bomber, it was like any other day, or at least it was supposed to be. They had taken off from a base near Fairbanks, Alaska. A few hours of flight were enough to test the engine modifications. However, as they soared through the sky, the day took a terrifying turn. Suddenly, pilot Leon Crane was hanging by the straps under the canopy of his parachute, watching in horror as the bomber spiraled down a few miles ahead of him into the Tanana River Valley. Something had gone terribly wrong, the instruments went haywire, and his only choice was to jump. He didn't know what had become of the rest of the crew. He saw the co-pilot eject, but there were no other parachutes in sight. What happened to the others? He landed in loose snow and quickly gathered up his parachute. He found himself near the riverbank. The wind carried the scent of burning, and he could see the glimmers of fire. He estimated he was no more than two miles from the wreckage. The plane, full of fuel, would burn for some time, which was good for rescuers. However, all their equipment, from food to weapons, was likely destroyed in the fire, possibly along with his comrades. He shouted as loud as his voice would allow, calling for the co-pilot and then each crew member by name. No response. Only a near-audible silence enveloped him. He was alone. It was beginning to get dark. He took a few steps and realized that beneath the snow was nothing but rocks. He couldn't possibly make it to the crash site in the night. A slip on the rocky terrain would be fatal. Fortunately, the 23-year-old pilot wasn't entirely unprepared. He had a silk parachute which could serve as a sleeping bag. He was dressed in a flight suit, heavy boots, and three pairs of socks. His head was covered with a flying cap, and he had a knife and a pack of matches in his pocket. The only thing he forgot in his hurried escape was gloves, and he immediately feared frostbite on his fingers. He tucked his hands under his armpits. How long had it been since the last report to base? At least an hour before the crash. That's not good. It means the search area will be vast, at least within a 200-mile radius from the last known position. The temperature was dropping even faster than the darkness. He estimated it to be about 40 degrees below zero. He needed to start a fire. He collected wood from the surroundings and cleared away the snow. His fingers were almost numb, but somehow, he managed to light a match. The flame wasn't enough to start a fire. After wasting four matches and barely warming his fingertips, he remembered his father's letter in his pocket. The paper ended up among the wood, and with a flick of a match, he finally started a fire. Soon, he was warming up next to it and fell asleep wrapped in the parachute. From the break of dawn, he assessed his chances. The short daylight hours didn't leave much time for rescue planes, and in those regions, they'd call off the search in a day or two if they didn't find him. At least he didn't have to worry about water. There was a stream murmuring under the ice. But what about food? His fingers were beginning to turn pale, a first sign of frostbite. Convinced his only chance was to follow the stream, he packed up his things. He called out for his comrades once more, but with no response, he set off. The stream had to lead to something. Perhaps the Yukon River. There would surely be trappers there. He soon realized that this journey wouldn't be easy. It took him hours to cover just one mile. He slipped over frozen stones, sank into waist-deep snow, and night fell without much progress. He had to light another fire, but now, without any paper left. It took several matches to succeed. Not good. At this rate, his match supply would only last a few days. As he warmed himself, he stared at his hands. He didn't like their color. It would be foolish to continue further. It was better to stay near the crash site for at least a week. Maybe rescuers would find him. Then his stomach began to growl. He needed to find something to eat. Squirrels were the only creatures around that neither migrated nor hibernated in these parts. He broke off a branch and sharpened it into a spear. He aimed and threw. Miss. He tried to sneak up on the animal. Another miss. Frustrated, he started hurling stones at them, cursing. Damn squirrels! For the next three days, he shivered, wrapped in his parachute, only getting up to drink water from the stream and keep the fire going. Meanwhile, back at the base, efforts were tirelessly underway. Over 20 planes were dispatched in a desperate search, yet none returned with any sightings. For a while, no one touched the crew's lockers at the airfield, until the inevitable acceptance of loss prompted their belongings to be packed and sent to their grieving families, accompanied by telegrams expressing condolences. 
During this time, Crane decided to take action. He abandoned following the stream. Eight days after the crash, he ventured into the unknown, deeper into the forest. To take a step, he had to clear away the snow. He stumbled, fell, got up, and pressed on. Two hours later, he stopped. He had covered just a couple of hundred meters. It felt like at least 100 miles. Exhausted, he returned to the riverbank. The fire was still smoldering. He stoked it, wrapped himself in the parachute, and fell asleep. He tried again the next morning, this time crossing the river. He moved between the white hills, encouraging himself. Behind the next bend, I'll see a cabin with smoke rising from the chimney. There I will drink hot coffee. But behind every bend was another hill. Twilight turned to night when Crane thought he saw something ahead. It looked like a cabin. A few more steps, and yes, it was indeed a cabin. He ran towards it, shouting. He cleared the snow and opened the door. Inside, it was empty except for some sacks on a table. Unable to untie the knots with his frozen fingers, he used his knife. Sugar, and not just sugar. Cocoa, powdered milk, and raisins, too. He shoveled a handful of raisins into his mouth, lit a fire, and cooked cocoa. It didn't take long for him to fall asleep. When he woke up, he stepped out of the cabin. There was the river again, bending westward. Downstream, there must be a village. He set off in that direction. An hour later, he realized he was still in the middle of nowhere. No village, no people, not even animal tracks. It was better to return to the cabin. He staggered along the river, icicles dangling from his nose. Pulling them off was too painful. Night fell. If he stopped, he would die. He had to force himself to walk. One step, one breath. Dawn broke, but there was no sign of the cabin. Worse, the landscape didn't look familiar. Around noon, he finally spotted the cabin. He had been walking for more than 30 hours. He burst through the door and immediately lit a fire. Again, he wrapped himself in the parachute and fell asleep. Two days later, hunger forced him to get up. He remembered seeing a small shed, almost buried in snow, outside the house. He dug it out and found a treasure trove inside. Food, clothes, a rifle and ammunition, and even lined gloves. For the next three weeks, he regained his strength. Then, on the move again. He made a sled from old boards, packed all the food and equipment, and set off. It was February 12th, 53 days after the crash, when he closed the cabin door behind him and continued his journey. The journey wasn't easy. He plowed through the snow, step by step, dragging the sled. In the first hour, he covered just half a mile. But he didn't stop. If he had survived nearly two months, he could survive the rest. He took breaks, setting up a new camp every evening. In the morning, he continued on. Seven days since leaving the cabin, his legs almost moved on their own, covering four miles daily. He came upon another cabin, also deserted. After resting, he continued onward. March 7th, March 8th, March 9th. On March 10th, Crane stumbled into a clearing adorned with pine boughs, an unmistakable sign of a makeshift airstrip in the wilderness. Driven by a newfound hope and the nearing promise of rescue, he pressed forward through the forest until he emerged into a clearing that hosted a solitary cabin. Its chimney released a steady stream of smoke and clothes danced lightly in the crisp air pinned to a line stretched between trees. Suddenly, a figure stepped out from the cabin, pausing to light a cigarette while fixing a gaze on Crane. Salvation had come at last. The figure was Albert Ames, a local hunter, residing in the backcountry with his family. He listened Crane's extraordinary story of survival. The haggard appearance, the oddly puffed jacket, the unkempt hair. Then realized Crane had traveled more than 100 miles downriver, alone, with little wilderness experience in Alaska in the dead of winter, and marveled. The next day, he harnessed his dog team, ushering Crane onto the sled that would take them to the nearest airfield, where Crane would finally escape the clutches of the wild that had been his unforgiving home. Thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate your time and hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked what you saw, be sure to check out the other great content on our channel. Your support means the world to us, and we can't wait to bring you more. Thank you again, and see you in the next video.